Mr. Helmuth is going to play the 88 for us tonight. Joining up the Star Spangled Banner, please rise in about three seconds. Thank you very much. If, <clears throat> if any, if any precinct, hello. If any precincts have, thank you, Eric. If any precincts have not organized, please do so at the break. Seventeen will be upstairs at the break, and sixteen or thirteen over here. So, if you haven't organized, please do so and get your nomination papers and things back to Miss uh, Lucarelli. Uh, 18 over here. Okay, with the tennis kids selling cookies, you're still going to be over there. Okay, buy some cookies from the tennis girls and you're out there. Um, anybody not been sworn in yet? Any town meeting members not been sworn in? If so, please rise. Seeing none. Okay. I recognize the chair of the Board of Selectmen, Ms. Mahan. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. It is requested that the members of the Board of Selectmen oh, wait, and elected to do that whole thing. Just skip to the next one. To the next one? You gave me it, so I'll oh, skip to no. seven. All right. I didn't do it. It I is moved either. that if all the business of the meeting is set forth in the warrant for the annual town meeting is not disposed of at this session, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns Monday, May 9th, 2016, at 8 p.m. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? Well, I think we're going to be back anyways. Uh, announcements and resolution. Anyone have announcements? Ms. Mahan. Okay. I just want to apologize for town meeting and, and thank you all for uh, waiting for the Board of Selectmen. I appreciate your time. I know it's valuable. I just want to let you know we were discussing a very important agenda item and as a result of that for the June 14th, 2016 uh, debt exclusion election uh, polls open at 7 a.m., close at 8 p.m. We voted to place on three ballot questions. Uh, the first ballot question is a question concerning the Thompson and Gibbs uh, rebuild or renovate. The second question is the Arlington High School feasibility study request. And the third question is the Minuteman Regional Vocational School um, request. And they will appear in that order. So again, our apologies. Uh, but we didn't want to, we wanted to make sure we discussed everything that needed to be discussed on such an important issue that we now um, have a lot of work to get the message out and, and see what the citizens of Arlington say. So thank you very much for being patient with us. Thank you, Ms. Mahan. Mr. Tosti. I just want to remind you that uh, next week, two critically important issues to the, uh, to the town uh, will be coming up. On Monday, uh, we'll be taking up the Minuteman budget and the Minuteman building project. Um, and on Wednesday, the, uh, we'll be taking up the school construction uh, project, specifically the middle school. Um, the, uh, both of these issues are tough. The vote on the Minuteman issue was 10 to 8 on the Finance Committee. The vote on the school project was 11 to 8. So you really 
need to investigate this, you need to talk to people, you need to find out reasons pro and con, and really uh, enter this, because uh, these are tough issues. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tosti. Mr. Chaplain, did you have an announcement? Good evening, Adam Chaplain, town manager. I actually had two announcements. First, some of you may know that, uh, I believe about, just about two weeks ago, we kicked off a conceptual planning process for what we're calling Mass Ave Phase Two from Pond Lane. Uh, to the intersection of uh, Mass Mill and Jason in terms of streetscape and uh, improvements to be made to Mass Ave. Uh, so we had a public meeting on April 16th um, right here, uh, and we had very good attendance on that. And then next Thursday, May 12th, starting at 6 p.m., we're going to have something we're calling a walk shop where people will be able to meet in front of town hall and then walk to four different uh, hot spots that were identified at the first public meeting along that portion of the corridor to sort of have some on-site discussion about what people would like to see, again, as part of this conceptual planning process. So if any of you are able to attend, uh, that should be a great session. Um, David, if you could put that up. The second announcement uh, that I wanted to make was um, a clarification and an apology. In my answer to a town meeting member's question uh, on Monday evening under Article 29, I was asked whether or not uh, the removal of the easement restriction uh, would allow for the creation or the building of a second home, and I said it was my understanding that there would just be the renovation of uh, the existing home. <laughs> However, um, I learned that I was mistaken, and I think the map is here behind. On that site, I'm not, this isn't working, but on the site you can see the existing home at 54 Pleasant View Road, and below would be the building footprint that could be built um, at the second site with the release of the exterior line. So, um, I was mistaken, I want to make that very clear um, so that if there's any town meeting members who felt that their vote was impacted by that answer, um, I didn't want that to have any impact. So again, my apologies. Ms. Howard? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jane Howard from Precinct 10 also a member of Vision 2020's Spy Pond Committee. Uh, I announced that on uh, a week from Saturday, May 14th, there will be the 11th Spy Pond Trails Day. And I hope that some of you can join us. We'll be doing the same things that we've done for the last 11 years. Protect the pond, improve the access to the, town, to the pond, uh, try to remove the invasives, especially the bittersweet and the garlic mustard, and pick up trash. Last Saturday, the same uh, effort took place, but the people who were working on it were 50 kids from the Arlington Belmont crew. So this time, we will meet with the Appalachian Mountain Club volunteers, and they'll guide us through these, these efforts. Um, if you do come, and children are invited, but children under 12 should be supervised by their own parents or guardians. And those under 18 have to have permission from the parent or guardian that they bring with them. Otherwise, do come, uh, bring gloves and pruning shears and lots of energy. We'll have snacks. And uh, if you want to gather at the end of the effort, uh, bring a lunch and we can share it together. So it's from 9 to 11 at that path abutting Route 2 from Pleasant Street to Lake Street. Thank you. There are, Thank you. There are cards in the back of the, on the table. Thank you, Ms. Howard. Any other announcements or resolutions? Okay, I'll get to you in one second. Um, we have our clickers back. Tonight we have the owner of the company, Mark Flight, here with us. We know about Mr. Murnau couldn't make it the first night. Last time, from what I understand, that big box with the silver sides, the the master controller kept losing touch with our clickers every time we went to have a vote. So we would turn the vote on and all the clickers would disappear. That's what the problem was. They fixed it, they got a new computer for us, rebooted, I don't know what they did. But Mr. Um, Lathwood assures me it's working. And in that regard, he's written us a test question. I'm not taking credit for this one. As today is Star Wars Day, may the fourth be with you. Are you a Star Wars fan or not? If one, if you are, two, if you're not. Are you ready, Mr. Lathwood? He's ready. So here we go. We're going to get a green light and a clock. And we can now vote.
Hey, Dave, is our resolution right? We're missing part of our numbers. And then we're going to scroll through, find out who's not. Check, check, make sure you, sh you showed up properly. So it looks like it's a yes vote, even by two thirds. So the town of Arlington's officially Star Wars fans. Ah, uh, there we go. Perfect. Thank you. Nine, yes, okay. Thank you, Mr. Good. All right, while we finish that, uh, Mr. Tosti. Yes, sir. <coughs> oh, Al, are you going to put Al? Uh, Charles Foskett, Precinct 8, and the uh, chairman of the Capitol. Oh, Charlie, wait a second. I'll have to take three off the table for us. Move that Article 3 be taken from the table. Second. Okay, Article 3 is on the table. Mr. Mr. Foskett. Uh, Charlie Foskett, Precinct 8, and uh, Chairman of the Capital report. Planning Committee, I'd like to ask that the uh, Capital Planning Committee report be received. Second. All in favor of receiving the Capital Planning Report, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? It's unanimous vote. Now capital planning report is now before us. Okay, any other reports of committees? No, nope. okay, go ahead, Chuck. Put three back on the table. Move the three be uh, placed on the table. All in favor, please say yes. yes. Article three is on the table. That brings us to article eight. Ms. Sir. One of the, uh, one of our um, members, um, Christian Klein did file a motion for reconsideration. You would speak with him. Hold on, Patricia. We have before us the recommended vote of the uh, ARB of no action. Uh, Ms. Ms. Warden. Patricia Warden, Precinct 8. I move the substitute motion on Article 8, which was placed on your seats, and would like to introduce Arlington resident Chris Loretti to speak on it. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Chris Loretti, Precinct, I'm sorry, 56 Adams Street. Um, if you could bring up the PDF slide, please. I'd like to point out one Scrivener's error under gross floor area on B. At the end of the line, please scratch out the comma after more through except as excluded in four below and leave the semicolon. Four was deleted below the original four, so that line is now superf superfluous. If you can leave that up and I'll go on while people make that change. I'd like to make a few things perfectly clear as I start. In, in particular, one key difference between this substitute motion and the ARB vote is that this motion does not amend the definition of a cellar or a basement and therefore it has no effect on whether a cellar or basement is counted as a story. It does make two substantive changes to the zoning bylaw. The first is to return the ceiling height used in the definition of a half story to seven feet. And the second is to eliminate an exception in the floor area calculation for mechanical spaces in the attic when they are in a space um, that has more than seven feet. There, Reasons for going back to that seven-foot change required me to give you a little bit of background on the history of the zoning bylaw. Our current bylaw was passed in 1975. At that time, the ceiling height was set at seven feet to be consistent with the building code. It remained that way until 2001, and then the building code changed, and the height in the building code was raised to seven feet three inches. At that time, town meeting changed the zoning bylaw to be consistent. The, the building code has since reverted to seven feet, 
And the reason for changing the zoning bylaw is to be consistent with the building code. As the ARB reported in their 2001 report to town meeting, having two different heights was, was very confusing to people. And if you saw the letter in the Advocate this past week, there was one poor fellow who was completely confused about these two things and thought there was some conspiracy going on to limit the height of ceilings in attics to seven feet. That's not the case at all. You can build your uh, ceiling height as high as you want in the attic, and this uh, bylaw change has no effect on it. Um, the other thing that this does is it makes it administratively easy, easier for the building inspectors. Now they only have to deal with one ceiling height, the same for this, the building code as in the zoning bylaw. So given that history, if anyone tries to tell you that this change to seven feet is not ready for prime time, tell them it's been prime time for 25 years, and now it's time to return to maintain that consistency. The reason for excluding the mechanical areas um, from the calculation of the gross floor area stems from a recommendation of the, of the Zoning Board of Appeals, which is the board that deals um, with special permits for one and two family homes. They handle the vast majority of them. It's rarity that the ARB itself deals with them. And they have noted that people will try to come in with large areas that are very obviously going to be converted to, um, to habitable space and try to claim that they qualify for that exemption. So we put that, um, eliminated that exemption at their recommendation. Um, if I could have the fourth slide, please. The fourth one? Right there, thank you. I live in one of these two-family houses on an undersized lot in East Arlington. So I naturally, and, and frankly, when I retire, I may be one of these people who want to build out that third floor as much as they can. So I took a look at just what the effect would be uh, on this. And if you look at that, you'll see two squares up there. One, the larger square has an outline in red, and the inner square is in white. And you can see there's very little difference. What this change would mean um, is that you would have count roughly 28 more square feet in the attic as gross floor area. That would mean for a new house, 2.8 or two, um, yeah, 2.8 more square feet of landscaped open space and three times that much of usable open space. It would also mean perhaps a reduction of 28 feet square feet if I wanted to build a dormer. It's a trivial change, and I, I think you really need to understand that. I also want to talk a little bit about the, the politics of all of the opposition we've been hearing about um, the zoning bylaw changes. I served on the redevelopment board for over five years, and I never saw such orchestrated opposition to such minor changes. And I suggest to you that, um, you know, that w we've been hearing a lot about property rights from Arlington's Tea Party Democrats, but we really need to think about community. Because when I look at this change and consider the effect on my home, I'm quite willing to give up that small amount of extra space in my attic based on the expectation that my neighbors will do the same. And I understand and they understand that that is to the benefit of the town as a whole. And, and you know, if you're new to town meeting, it must be confusing to you about why the ARB switched its vote at the very last minute. And I would suggest to you that some of that has to do with pressure from the selectmen who are very closely aligned with the real estate you're, machine you're in Arlington. There's speculation there, Chris. That's the speculating and, you know, it's the clear to me. It's clear to me that if the town is going to just take a just say no approach to residential zoning changes uh, such as this one, there is no hope whatsoever for the more substantial changes described in the master plan ever being implemented. So I ask you to support the substitute motion to show your support for the inspectional services staff who recommended the seven foot change, for the zoning board of appeals who recommended closing the loophole, for the planning department staff who were working on this for months before all of this opposition emerged, and for the ARB itself which recommended the seven foot change to that ceiling height. And I also ask you to support this motion to show that you understand the importance of doing what's best for the community rather than looking at just what all the special interests have been put, putting forward on this article. Um, again, this is something that is critical if the master plan recommendations 
as they pertain to residential zoning, are, are going to be implemented. As I said, the town in the past had kept the seven foot ceiling height consistent with the building code. It's, con it's important to con continue doing so. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Mahan. I would respectfully request through you that Arlington resident Lynn Lowenstein be permitted to speak to the body. She's an Arlington citizen. She can talk. Mr. Lowenstein. Good evening. Lynn Lowenstein, Precinct 11, former town meeting member, former member of the Redevelopment Board, former member of the Sims Advisory Committee Medical Use Group, former member of the Town Day Volunteer Committee, member of the Town Day. I'm not very good at public speaking. I get very nervous, so you'll have to forgive me as I plod through this, hoping I do right by my colleagues. I'm going to take my father's advice, which is stand up to be seen, speak up to be heard, and then sit down to be appreciated. If you could indulge me just one minute to give you some personal background, which I think is pertinent to why I'm standing here. Many of you in here know me and know that I love the town of Arlington. My family has lived here for almost 60 years. While a member of the board of directors at the Boys and Girls Club, I put together a fundraiser called A Touch of Ireland, which was held here in Town Hall, and we raised $30,000. To celebrate my five-year mark as a breast cancer survivor, I, I formed a 501c3 corporation called Let's Tackle Breast Cancer, the purpose of which is to raise money to help breast cancer patients and survivors in Arlington. Our first fundraising effort raised almost $30,000. I mention these things to you not to be self-serving, but so that you might understand how much I care about this town. So when I stand before you to talk about Article 8 and the zoning articles as a whole, I do so because I care. Mr. Loretti, I'm sorry, I am a realtor, so let's get that on the table because I think that is a dirty word to some people. But I've been helping people buy and sell homes here for over 20 years, and I'll always be able to do that. That's not going to change. I'm part of this effort because I see how these changes will affect individual homeowners. We're all in agreement that changes need to be made to the zoning bylaws. Please don't think otherwise. My colleagues in this effort and I all live here. In fact, with the birth of his granddaughter, Corey, Bill Coppathorn's family is now a sixth generation Arlington family. I'm not sure too many people can boast that. We care about the future of our town and we have a personal vested interest in making this the best place to live for future generations. It's the overall effect of these changes that is of utmost concern to us. We don't feel we should be taking the residential zoning bylaws out of context and piecemealing them as part of a knee-jerk reaction. We feel they need to be considered as part of a cumulative, cohesive whole unit, not individually. Article 8 is so confusing to me, as well as to my colleagues. It claims to drop all references to basements and whether basements are stories, yet in the third line of the definition for story, it clearly states a basement shall be deemed to be a story when its ceiling is four feet, six inches or more above the finished grade. And the new definition of gross floor area includes basement. So what if the basement's less than five, seven feet in height? It's not considered habitable space, but it's still factored into the overall gross floor area and open space requirements. So ultimately, this could prevent a homeowner from adding onto his or her home. And I'm sorry, I don't understand the seven foot story, half story, measured from subfloor to bottom of the roof joist. I, I know that you tried to make it simple, but I can't get my head around it. I know I'm an intelligent person, but it's very confusing to me. And I'm sure confusing to a lot of the people here. I hope that a future speaker can provide some clarity. As the ARB stated, zoning is complicated. Any zoning proposal put before town meeting should be as clear and readily understandable as possible, particularly when it has such a major effect. This is certainly not readily understandable. All I know is that these changes, if adopted, will impact many homeowners in Arlington, some of whom are probably sitting right in this room. To put salve on the wound, Article 8 defaults to by special permit. The zoning board is already overburdened. If each of these special cases now has to go through the special permit process, the ZBA will not be able to handle the caseload. Having been a member of the ARB during the Sims Hospital Arlington 360 era, I am very well aware of the enormous amount of time that these processes involve. We need to respect the fact that these are volunteer positions, but most importantly, you need to consider the impact that this will have for homeowners planning additions and renovations to say nothing of the amount of money involved in hiring architects, 
site engineers and attorneys, and then waiting to get on the docket for an already overworked committee. It will be frustrating at best. Currently, I understand that there is a five-month backlog. I can't imagine what will happen if these changes are to take place. One thing I do fear is people will be so frustrated and disillusioned that they'll no longer go through the permit process. And that will have a deleterious effect on the value of their homes. The first thing a home inspector will say to a buyer is, check with the building department to be sure they pulled a permit to do the work. I'm afraid that more and more buyers will pull back out of potential purchases if permits were not pulled, because permits give them a sense of security that the job was done correctly in a workmanlike manner, and it was signed off on by appropriate personnel. I want to reiterate, contrary to popular belief, we are not by any means against zoning changes. What we are against is taking them out of context, picking and choosing, and instituting policies and regulations that have not been fully vetted. It's our belief that much more focus has to be concentrated on the residential zoning bylaws. We feel that a committee should be formed with members of the community, including the ARB, Planning Department, Inspectional Services, member of the Citizen Zoning Reform Group, individual homeowners who are considering renovations and additions, homeowners who live in the heights on the hill or on irregular lot configurations, multifamily owners, builders, contractors, and realtors. There needs to be representation from each of these groups so that all concerns are heard and that everybody knows how any proposed zoning changes will directly affect them. Finally, to the citizens group, we know that you have put a great deal of time and effort into this process, as have we, and although we may disagree, we certainly appreciate your dedication. You have some valid concerns, but these cannot and should not be voted on in a vacuum. Zoning is complex. Changing one provision creates a domino effect that may have unintended consequences. Let's take a step back and do this in a smart, sensitive, open manner with much better communication through public outreach and input. The number of people we've spoken to have absolutely no idea about any of this is mind-boggling. Let's make sure the word gets out and the process is much more inclusive. I respectfully ask that you please vote no action on Article 8 substitute motion. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Lonsky. No, no, no. We don't know clapping. Um, Ms. Knobloch, Mr. Klein, I got you. Nicole Knobloch, Precinct 8. Um, I'm going to speak for a couple of minutes and I'm going to introduce a member of the town who wanted to speak who's also a realtor. Uh, one thing, turn on the time please. <laughs> one thing I did want to say is I think it is valid that, um, that it's a complicated issue and as a homeowner who has had to pull a permit simply to replace a rotting porch experienced a lot of frustration even getting that done. I am totally sympathetic to how difficult it is when you want to maintain the value of your home and improve it. Um, and I also, to that point, I really appreciated all the letters from the homeowners that were in our packets on the first day of town meeting. I thought that was a kind of constructive um, dialogue and good examples that we need about what kinds of things people are considering so that people can avoid you know, feeling like uh, were under siege by villainous developers. Having said that, I worry a little when I hear people say, let's be, sh you know, let's make sure we hear from everyone, let's make sure we consider property rights. And I just want to um, urge that when the redevelopment board does go over this issue again, that the property rights of people who are not planning to revise, you know, to revise their home in any way are also considered in this process. And that's the right to live in a, in a, neighborhood that looks a certain way, in a neighborhood that has a certain kind of landscape, in a home that is not overshadowed by a home right next to it, very close to it. Um, all of those concerns are also very valid property rights concerns, and I think they're incredibly important, and the voices of people who are not under contract or about to be can be lost when making these decisions. Um, I have personal experience with what can happen to a neighborhood when there are teardowns uh, kind of relentlessly without good zoning. I grew up in a suburb of Chicago that was a 1950s suburb with smaller homes, many of which actually were very well built um, and didn't necessarily need to be torn down like some of the ones do, in fact, in our neighborhoods here. 
Um, but what we've seen there is some really enormous houses that are out of scale, not simply because they're tall or wide, but because they are so close to the adjoining houses. We've seen a lot of paving over of uh, grass and other permeable surfaces. We've seen trees come down. And the effect of that is aesthetic. It also threatens uh, properties like the one that I grew up in, a beautiful home that is now totally overshadowed and um, literally cheek by jowl in a former prairie neighborhood um, with this enormous house that has come in. But the other issue there is a very real one, which is flash flooding. We're having terrible storms out in the Chicago area, just like we're starting to see here, where we're having changing precipitation now from having drought to having deluges, and we have to think about permeable surfaces. So there are a lot of considerations when people talk about balance that I hope will still be balanced in as the redevelopment board goes through this process. Um, having said that, I also want to uh, cede the rest of my time to Jonathan Nyberg, who is also a realtor and who is a member of the town of, uh, sorry, a resident of the town of Arlington. Thank you. Mr. Nyberg is a citizen of Arlington. He can speak. You have three minutes and 46 seconds left, Mr. Nyberg. Thank you. My name is Jonathan Nyberg, 129 Lake Street. As I read the article that are before us, I honestly feel there's good pieces of this and then other pieces that don't fit so well. And I feel in these articles we're asked to put together a bit of a zoning puzzle. We're getting pieces of the puzzle, but we're not seeing the whole puzzle. And I think it's important, as with my niece and nephew, when they get a thousand piece puzzle, they put the picture of it in front of them and then they go to work on all the pieces. I think we need a bigger picture before we can vote on each of the pieces of that picture. I feel, um, as Annie Lacourt said last week, if we had more facts and more figures and understand the full impact, I think we can make a more rational decision instead of an emotional decision. And I think we owe it to the residents of Arlington to make uh, a fully rounded decision. Having gone to the ARB meetings, I think we should follow their vote of no action until we get more facts. Thank you and I wish you the best tonight. Thank you very much, sir. Mr. Warden, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John, John Warden, Precinct 8. Um, <coughs> well, first, uh, it seemed to me the uh, speaker a couple back, uh, Ms. Lowenstein, uh, seemed to be get, launching a tirade about special permits. There's no special permits in Article 8. This is just <laughs> definitions. So uh, she uh, was, uh, I guess, thinking of something that was taken care of last week. Um, so that was a little, uh, a little uh, disconcerting. Um, the, um, and the, the, other, the other point I should like to make to, to her and her community and, and the last speaker is, and this, this idea of, we'll get to it in 11 if we ever get there, uh, about having a, another study committee, uh, fine, uh, we, we need to talk. But will, 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 the, will the building and demolition uh, lobby, uh, will they have a moratorium for the period while we're talking? That, that, would, that, that would make everybody happy, I think. Um, I, I wanted to point out that the, um, the, uh, some, there, there has been some thought that the, 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 um, the redevelopment board, that they must know what they're talking about because they're the experts in this area. And I just, I just wanted to say a couple things on that. Mr. Loretti, who addressed you at, at the beginning, uh, was on the, uh, I would say Mr. Loretti knows more about zoning, particularly Arlington zoning bylaw, than anyone else in this room. He was on the redevelopment board himself for five years. He was the chairman for a year. Um, and uh, I, I think I need not say more. Uh, uh, Mrs. Pyle is, is a zoning attorney. She's been in business for a number of years. And she does the very hard work of defending neighborhoods from 40B developers. It doesn't get much tougher than that as a lawyer. I'm a lawyer and I know about that. Um, Myself, um, I, I am a lawyer. I've, I've helped hundreds of people buy homes, sell homes, appear before zoning boards, planning boards, conservation commissions, and so on. Um, the, when my very first town meeting in, in 1970, I stood with the people of East Arlington who were opposing 
three 20-story towers that the Mugars wanted to put on their swamp down in East Arlington. We didn't have wetlands then, we, we had swamps. Um, but, um, and so so that, 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 that was how I got started. In, in 1978, <coughs> I don't know, most of you are probably too young to remember the great blizzard of 1978, but that night, the very night the blizzard struck, the redevelopment board was sitting right here in this hall with the developer's team holding a so-called public hearing uh, on a proposal to put a 13-story tower almost across the street from Town Hall down in Mill Street. Uh, there was one member of the public there, me, because um, I lived just around the corner. Um, and um, we, uh, they, they approved that building, but I led the fight in town meeting, and we, um, uh, we changed the zoning bylaw to five stories, so that, and that's been the cap on building heights in Arlington ever since. Um, now, th there has been a lot of confusion, or we, the redevelopment board cites confusion is the reason that uh, they withdrew their uh, articles through their own, uh, their, their own work of their own planning staff uh, under the bus. Um, well, I would say that the confusion is caused not because zoning is that difficult, but because of the propaganda that was put out. And uh, first we had the scary anonymous postcard, and then we had the, uh, what called the lion flyer. Uh, anybody struck by the coincidence uh, how the uh, similar these uh, 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 proposals uh, were in, in their format and so on? Probably just a coincidence. Uh, but the, and the, the point is that not one of the buildings, the additions, whatever they're talking about here, that they say couldn't happen is true. Every one of those, none of those things would be barred by any of the articles, not only particularly Article 8, for heaven's sake, but, but, but the, the other articles that we dealt with last week. So, 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 so much for confusion. The, 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 the bo zoning is complicated, but it's the job of the experts to try to decomplicate it, not, 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 not just cave in. Um, so um, I would um, ask you to, to support Article 8. It's, it's a very minor change, as Mr. Loretti pointed out. And yes, the basement is mentioned, but the, the, thing, the one thing that people were most concerned about at the Redevelopment Board Forum took place in this room, um, no, it took place next door at Central School, uh, was that their basement, the, the Redevelopment Board wanted to change the height, the countable height of a basement from 4.6 to 3.6. That's out. We haven't changed that. So yeah, it's still in there. It's always been there. It's not changed. So, so that, 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 that will not have any effect. So I, um, I, I, I urge you to support this, uh, th this minor thing. You, you know, z zoning has a large number of moving parts. Uh, we, we, you can't deal with them all at once. You have to deal, you have to deal with them uh, w one by one. And, and this, this is one that has very little effect, but, but it's important that it be done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Come on. We're not supposed to clap and do that sort of stuff. I keep asking every time, and you guys keep doing it. Mr. Burnell. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good evening. Andrew Burnell, Chair of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. Uh, it is the job of the experts to decomplicate zoning. That's why the Arlington Redevelopment Board, board decided to vote no action on articles. Uh, 8, 9, and 10, any, any other article that proposes substantive changes in the zoning bylaws this year. Uh, it's the opinion of the board that these articles require more input, more education, more outreach to the town. Uh, make sure that any and all stakeholders' voices are heard and taken into consideration so that all the facts and all the figures can be taken into consideration so that we can put something in front of town meeting that we feel supportive of, we feel we can support, and we feel that we can ask for town meetings vote on. Any substantive change needs to go through a process, uh, and I would urge that any substantive change be voted down this year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burnell. Uh, Mr. Fisher. Uh, Andrew Fisher, Precinct 6. Precinct six. Right into the mic, Mr. I'm sorry. Fisher. I'm sorry, Andrew Fisher, Precinct 6. I just want to make 100% sure of what we're talking about. There are two Article 8 amendments here it's, in my packet. 
It's the one signed by Patricia Warden. Uh, will you? Yes, sir. Yeah, we're talking about the um, substitute motion, Andrew. Not the amendments, they were last week, they're gone. We now have a substitute. I, I have that two in, I have two that are in one package. Uh, any of them? One is signed by Mr. Warden and one is signed by Mrs. Warden. What's it say up top? One says Article 8 Amendment and the- That's gone. Article, the other says also Article 8 Amendment. Yeah, we're looking at one that says Article 8 Substitute Motion and down the bottom, it should have a w w relatively recent date of a day today or two days ago. Uh, I, okay, I don't May have 2nd? it, I'm sorry. Yeah. It should have a, a date of it, May 2nd it, down at the bottom. It, it, let me ask you this, is this only dealing with ceiling height? Excuse me? It's, it's dealing with me mechanical rooms and ceiling height? It, um, it, they are striking out, but excluding attic space and other areas for elevator machinery or mechanical equipment necessary to the operation of the building. Can you show that, Mr. Um, Good? Here you go. Okay, thank you. Scroll I'm gonna vote yes. Some. Scroll up. But mainly I want to speak about the seven foot rule. Um, in 1986, I did the drawings for my own house, 135 Wildwood at the time, it was right behind the Shell gas station. And it really truly is simple, but you have to know about it. Um, some people think you can only develop the front half or the back half of your attic. But the way it works is, as the roof line goes up, the square feet don't count until, this, in, until the ceiling becomes seven feet tall. So you do a drawing, and I have no training, I just did it, uh, except for reading blueprints, and you figure out what you can build. The seven feet or the seven feet three doesn't affect the way it looks on the outside. Um, if it was up to me, people could have seven th foot three or seven foot six even if you move the front wall back a foot be because it makes it look like a cottage. Um, a few months after I did my attic, um, Jack DeMille on Coleman wanted to do his and he was fiddling in with it and uh, he was told just make the whole ceiling under seven feet. And what he did was, I mean, was uh, the, the side wall was simply three stories. It was simply straight up. So what I'm saying is the seven foot or seven foot three doesn't affect the aesthetics. And I would not be afraid to address this in a way that does affect the, the aesthetics. And I could guarantee you, um, that developers and neighbors would both like it. Uh, I suppose I'm remiss for never having addressed it, but I'm gonna vote yes for this just because I want to say we can and, and should take action. Also, nobody asked for great big data when we went from seven foot to seven three. We were simply told the state had changed or the state standard was seven foot three and Alan McLennan said, we want to make ours in, uh, in harmony with the state. I voted against that, um, and to tell you the truth, for not very good reasons. But I'm going to vote for this, and it's honestly, that's, if, if we did vote yes, then there will be forced to make real change. I want to make that statement. If we vote no, who knows, it'll just keep going on. So. I don't think if there was anything else. Uh, but the seven foot thing is not interesting. It's not complicated. It, when we went from seven foot to seven foot three, it didn't enable all kinds of development to happen any differently. And going from seven to say, three to seven foot um, also is, thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Jameson.
Thank you, Mr. Moderator Gordon Jamerson, Precinct 12. I move this article and all matters before us. Thank you. We have a motion to terminate debate. Second? All in favor of terminating the debate, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. In my opinion, it is a two-third vote. Um, yes, Mr. Peluso. Is it a point of order? I'm glad you called up Ted Peluso from Precinct 6. I'm glad you called on me after the vote because here's what I feel. Whoa, whoa, Ted, you can't get up and argue. We've terminated debate. Excuse me. No. Just you, give me a minute. This no, is no, important. sir, sir, we've, we've terminated debate, this, Mr. Peluso. I'm not talking about terminating debate. We've this voted? is not a debate. You're done. Yeah, excuse me. Everybody sir. in this room took. Ted, please, we voted to terminate debate. We can't get up and hurry. I'm not debating the issue. We've, there's nothing on the table, sir. We're at the vote well, stage. How do I get two minutes of time? You raise your hand, and then someone. I raised my hand. I'm not debating the issue. Ted. It's something entirely please, different. Please, please. More important. No, Ted. Mr. Poluso, okay. please. Okay. Please. <laughs> What's your point of order, sir? We have. Then, then, then you have to parse out what was said before debate was terminated. Look at the papers we were given and make your vote based upon the facts that were given to us before Mr. Jamison terminated debate. Ms. Mamone, what's your point of off? Memon. You can contest my call of a two thirds vote. All right. All right, we'll do it with a clicker. All right, we're going to do a clicker vote of uh, the termination of debate. All in favor of terminating debate, please press 1 when we get the light. All opposed, press 2. All right, debate's not terminated. Mr. Peluso, you're actually next on the list. I don't care how you vote. Yes, no, I don't care. But I have to tell you something. It doesn't matter, I want to take a minute. I heard a man insult our selectmen. Everybody in this room took an oath to treat people civilly, and I'm going to make a motion that Mr. Leone call that guy up here and have him apologize to our selectmen. Unless I'm misunderstanding, he said something that was accusatory and completely unallowable. Who was it? Who, who was it, Mr. Uh, Peluso? Is Mr. Loretti? Mr. Loretti, please come forward and apologize. All right. Mr. Deist, Mr. Loretti, no more insulting people. Mr. Deist, you're next. Mr. McCabe, you are next. Uh, Mark McCabe, Precinct 2, and I stand to terminate debate on Article 8 <laughs> and all matters before it. Let's use the clickers. We have a motion to terminate debate. It's been seconded. All in favor of terminating debate as soon as Mr. Lathwood is ready. It's a two-thirds vote. 
So all in favor, please press one. All opposed, press two. Sixty that passes. It is a two-thirds vote, and I so declare it. We have now terminated the debate on the article. We are voting on the substitute motion of Miss Warden. It's a majority vote to substitute. All in favor of substituting the of Miss Warden, please vote one. All opposed, vote two. It is a negative vote, 146 in the negative, 70 in the positive. It is not substituted. We now have before us a recommended vote of the ARB of no action. All in favor of no action, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. No. It is a vote of no action. Five, four, no action. Now the reason I ask people not to clap after a speaker is a subtle form of intimidation. As Mr. Peluso correctly pointed out, we shouldn't be saying bad things about other people and we shouldn't be intimidating speakers and the town meeting members by clapping or expressing satisfaction or dissatisfaction with what the speaker says. That's why I don't allow um, people to speak out between speakers. Thank you very much for that. We now have Article 8. 9, excuse me. We've, that closes Article 8 brings us to Article 9. We have the recommended vote of the Board of um, ARB of no action. No substitute motions have been circulated. All in favor of no action on Article 9, please say yes. Yes. All opposed say no. It is a vote, and I so declare it. That closes Article 9 and brings us to Article 10. We have the recommended vote of the ARB of no action. Ms. Pyle. Good evening, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Pyle, and I'm a town meeting member from Precinct 10. I move that the Redevelopment Board's recommended vote on Article 10 be substituted with the motion that has previously been distributed in hard copy on your chairs to all town meeting members, and that was emailed to you. We have a second. It's been seconded. Go ahead, Ms. Pyle. The substitute motion contains the exact same language as the Arlington Redevelopment Board's Article 10 which amends the zoning bylaw on parking in residential districts. Can you put up the, the thing? Wait, thank you. By stating that any driveway leading to off-street parking on a lot cannot exceed a 15% slope except by special permit. I have brought this substitute motion tonight because this is a matter of public safety. The Redevelopment Board originally proposed this article because driveways steeper than 15% grade create public safety hazards. When a car is backing out of a driveway with a grade steeper than 15%, the rear windshield is pointed up too much to the sky and the driver cannot see small children on the sidewalk. Children and other pedestrians are also not used to looking down to see an exiting car, which exacerbates the situation. I am very concerned about this public safety hazard. Driveways with steep grades can also cause problems because shoveling them in the winter can be too difficult for some people, meaning more cars stick out into the sidewalk. This forces people to walk around the cars and out into the street in the snow causing a further potential safety hazard. Cars can also have more difficulty getting into and out of a steep driveway in the ice and snow in the wintertime. The planning department has informed me 
that the 15% grade was recommended by the town's engineering department based on safety concerns. I also understand from an architect on the redevelopment board that the standard for commercial development in driveway slope is 10 to 12% grade. Now, you may ask, how will this amendment affect my house? The answer is that this article will not require any changes to any existing homes. It will apply only to new driveways. You may wonder, how does this, how does this apply to houses on hills? I understand that the redevelopment board considered houses on hills when drafting this amendment, and that's why they added the special permit provision. This means that for unusual situations, driveways with a steeper grade may be allowed by special permit so that someone who can show that their proposed driveway is not a public safety hazard may be permitted to build one. This amendment will not prevent renovations or new construction. It may require architects or builders to come up with a way of housing a garage that does not have such a steep slope by slightly pushing the garage back or having some of the garage be below grade and some of it be above grade, for example. But this is a small price to pay for the public safety benefits that our town officials originally intended with this article. It would be a tragedy if we fail to take action on this amendment tonight and a house was built in the next year with a steep driveway and sometime in the future a car backing out of that driveway struck and injured or killed a small child. Let's not allow that to happen. We cannot wait for further study on this one. I strongly urge you to vote yes on the substitute motion for Article 10 to protect Arlington's children and pedestrians. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Revelick. Uh, hello, Steve Revelick, uh, Precinct 1, 111 Sunnyside Avenue. Um, I sympathize with the safety concerns that Ms. Pyle uh, expressed. Um, it would be indeed be a tragedy to see someone T-boned while trying to back out of their driveway. But as a safety measure, um, there's, I'm a, I do have some reservations about what's left out of it. So clearly one of the, you know, one of the, the issues backing out of a, a driveway is, it's not so much the slope, but it's the field of vision. It's how far can you see to the left? How far can you see to the right? How well are other vehicles able to see you? And there's nothing, there is nothing in this um, substitute motion that specifies, you know, the, a person six feet from the edge of the roadway shall be able to see X number of feet in either direction. You know, I've seen driveway mirrors in use where buildings are packed closely together um, so the idea behind a driveway mirror is, you know, there's a building or something, it's blocking, you know, your view up the road and you, you can't see what's, see what's coming, but the mirror allows you to basically see around the corner. Um, you know, and this, I, I think, could be an effective mitigation measure for, um, you know, for, redu for safety and for improving the field of vision, but that's not something that's mentioned in this substitute motion. Uh, we also have visual notifications as another option. If you've walked by a, the exit to a parking garage and seen a little sign fly, that flashes and says vehicle exiting, um, you know, this could also be a, uh, a, mitigation, a mitigating measure, but that's not mentioned either. Even, even the basic rectangular yellow sign that says blind driveway ahead would be you know, a, a, form of, a form of mitigation or simply you know, a, a parking ordinance that increased the distance um, that a parked vehicle had to be back away from the curb. You know, again, being able to increase, uh, increase you know, the field of vision. So I'm, um, I, I think it's, I, I think the, 
it's well intentioned, but I do believe it. I I am concerned that it falls short um, for in terms of the stated goal of creating a safer environment. So I will be not not be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you, sir, Mr. Tibbetts. Gary Tibbetts from Precinct 5, and uh, the previous speaker just took a lot of what I had to say, and I agree with him. And I think this is somewhat a backdoor measure to uh, shrink the size of new houses. And um, I've said before, I think that affects the value of the houses and the value of the houses to the people that have owned them for 40, 50, 60 years when they go on to sell them, and I'm against that. I'd like to uh, turn the rest of my time over to Bill Clopathon from Precinct 5, who can probably talk to this better than I can. Thank you. Mr. Copperthorne is a town resident. You got six minutes and 23 seconds. I'll be brief. Um, Bill Copperthorne, uh, many of you may know me, I'm a lifelong resident of the town. I'm a lifelong resident of the town and property owner. Uh, my family, with the addition of my, uh, my granddaughter, has now lived in this town for six generations. So I am very concerned with the fabric and look of this town. I am also the broker owner of Sweeney O'Connor Real Estate, for full disclosure here. And speaking on a professional level, I've, I've represented hundreds of buyers uh, coming into this town. And um, I, I am concerned on how some of these proposed changes are going to affect these folks that have scrimped and saved and uh, gotten, gotten their way into the great town that we, uh, we all enjoy. Um, I agree with many who have spoken before me that there's a, you know, a need for a thorough review of the zoning bylaws, but, and that is what should be done, a, a, a very thorough and uh, thoughtful review of, of the bylaws as we go forward, not the little piecemeal approach uh, as it's been pr presented to you over the past uh, week or so. Uh, I ask that we continue to vote in accordance with the ARB, the board that has been tasked to address these issues. Uh, and with their vote has been suggested to you as a vote of no action. Speaking directly to Article 10, the changes that are before you may seem small in scope and in in insignificant, but put into the broader scope of the bylaws have many unintended consequences depending on where you live in town. What fits in East Arlington does not work for homes in Heights, Morningside, Jason Heights, or around Mount Gilboa where many houses are built on hills. Not all lots are the same. They're not created equal. They all have their certain characteristics to them. Uh, the previous speaker mentioned that this article was uh, specific to new construction. I did not see anything in that article that was making this specific to new construction. Um, the, the proposed driveway grade, if passed, you know, may result in several homes in Arlington becoming non-conforming structures because of their driveway exceeding this, their grade, whether it's down or up, uh, you know, it would have an impact on what their view may be coming in and out of the driveway. Uh, proponents want you to believe this is a safety issue. I would submit that pulling in and out of the driveway is a safety issue regardless of the grade. Caution should be exercised at all times. If you have a steep driveway, you are aware of its proclivities during times of inclement weather and realize that caution should be exercised. Uh, common sense. I ask that you vote in accordance with the no action vote of the ARB and allow time for thoughtful and thorough review of the bylaws. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Ms. Weaver. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Janice Weaver, Precinct 21. Although I um, was in agreement with um, Elizabeth on her other article, I'd like to uh, vote f for no action on Article 10. I live on Mount Gilboa. I mean, not the mountain, but up there. And my driveway is by far 15 degrees or 20, whatever. It's extremely narrow. I share it with the people next door. It has been widened actually by a foot. My father got his big cable telephone truck up there and I don't know how. 
The thing is, um, as Mr. Klopfon spoke, you need to use common sense. I back up my driveway. I don't back down into the street, even though the people across the street choose to park across my driveway every day. Um, and I have no trouble doing that. And as far as the snow, if you don't have all-wheel drive or four-wheel drive living in this town, then there's something wrong. So I think if you just use a little common sense, I know you do have to be careful. I do understand the issues, and we do have a lot of children going by my driveway in the morning, but I'm always sure to. If I, don't, if I pull in, I turn around at the end of the driveway, but most of the time I do um, back up, and I've hardly ever scraped my bumper. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Weaver. Mr. Klein. Christian Klein, Precinct 10. Um, I'm rising just to add a little bit of context. Um, what is 15%? So a ramp that you have to have handles on for um, accessibility into a building is 8.3%, um, is as steep as that can get. My driveway is 7%. Um, the street in front of my house is 5%. The hill going up to Brackett School is about 10%. Um, the access road along Route 2 where it passes Highland is 7%. I, you can tell I spent the afternoon with a measuring device checking these things. Um, I took a tour over Park and Beacon Street. Um, most of those driveways, the, the lowered ones, are in the 19 to 24% grade. The steepest I found was 28. Um, over on Dorothy and Mott, they're sort of similar in that range. Um, and then there's a lot of houses that also have flat driveways that lead to their thing. So that just sort of gives you a sense as to sort of the scale of some of these dimensions that we're talking about. Um, putting on my hat as a member of the Zoning Board of Appeals, um, should you, I, I like this. I like the notion of this. I like the notion that you know that there are situations that would require special consideration. Um, if you have a driveway that's in excess of 15 percent, and it's because of the topography of your site, I would hope that the zoning board would look upon that very favorably. Um, but obviously, I'm unable to speak on behalf of the zoning board. The only thing I would ask is that if you do um, vote to to accept this um, and to spend to open these cases up for special permit review that as we look at Article 35, which includes the budget for the Zoning Board of Appeals, that you uh, consider offering us a little extra money so we can uh, do the administration that will be required for these. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Klein. The gentleman back here, three up from the rear. On the back on the right. All right, up there. Yeah. Nope, nope, not you, him. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, John Hoppy, Precinct 3. Let me move this up. So I'd like to speak in favor of this. Um, the, the safety concerns have already been gone over, but there are aesthetic concerns for this as well. Um, a house on my street, I live over on Teal Street in East Arlington, uh, was recently built that has a middle driveway underneath one of the side-by-side town -side townhouses. And an architect, friend of mine, a neighbor, uh, we were walking around and he pointed out that it's about 30% grade. And um, what that does is it creates about a 20 by 20 sort of just blank hole in front of a house. You can't wash a car there. It's, it, it's, it's too steep to stand on. You can't have a yard sale there. You can't, kid can't put up a lemonade stand there. Nothing. It's just, uh, I, I think we need to think about what would happen if the entire street, and over on my end of town, <laughs> This is a real possibility, I think, that a lot of these are going to start going up. In fact, they already have been. I would hate to see a street where you just walk down or drive down and it's just nothing but sort of big black spaces in front of the houses as opposed to the driveways and um, uh, yards that we, that we currently have. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, now your turn.
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, my name is Phil Goff. I'm in precinct number seven. And um, I wanted to ask this for just about um, all the zoning measures. I'm finally getting the chance um, if I could ask uh, Mr. Burnell or any others from the ARB to just simply explain um, why this particular uh, warrant article was uh, pulled at, in my interpretation at the last moment. I just want to get a sense for something that on one hand seems pretty clearly about safety was, and, and was voted on unanimously by the ARB was then removed sure. before uh, town meeting, please. At our meeting last week, it was decided to uh, have a discussion or reconsideration of the votes on Articles 8, 9, and 10. Is, we had decided to reconsider the votes on Articles 8, 9, and 10 together because they all affected uh, residential properties as opposed to Articles 6 and 7, which really impacted commercial districts. At the time, it was felt that more study was needed on across the board on all residential zoning articles, and therefore we revised our vote to no action on all three. Um, okay. Thank you very much. Something I've been curious about. Um, I, this has been a very difficult one for me. I've gone uh, back and forth a lot, uh, to be honest, on this one in particular. Um, I appreciate the effort originally, I guess, by the ARB and then from um, others in the citizens group who have um, put the substitute motion in front of us. Um, I think pedestrian safety uh, is a, is a critical, critical thing, of course, throughout the town, uh, including East Arlington. Um, I think there are other issues that were echoed, I think, quite well. Mr. Hopp kind of stole some of my thunder because I, I did want to um, speak to some of the um, aesthetic, although they're not just purely aesthetic. It's really about sort of the you know, community interaction uh, of a street uh, and think about, especially in East Arlington, um, where obviously the parcels are much smaller, think about the long view. Um, we know that on a handful of streets in East Arlington, there are are a number of uh, duplexes that have been redeveloped with the um, subgrade garages. I personally, I call them pit houses. It creates that large pit in front of the house. Um, I have an, I'm an urban designer. I have a background in planning. I worked for the planning department in Portland, Oregon, which is a city known for its uh, livability. Um, they had a problem with what people called snout houses. Those were garages that were um, protruding from uh, houses and really dominated the sidewalk and the streetscape. Um, it started out with just you know, a few houses here and there uh, in different neighborhoods and people weren't so concerned. Um, then it started to be spread all over simply because for um, developers and others who were rebuilding properties, it was certainly the least expensive thing to do based on the small lot zoning and a number of particular neighborhoods and whole neighborhoods became dominated by these snout houses. Um, People uh, rose up and sort of thought about the long view, as I think we need to think about here. Uh, especially in East Arlington, I can envision every year, you know, somewhere in East Arlington, somewhere in, in the town itself, a uh, uh, home burns down. Um, in the two-family zoning, for the most part, it, it seems as though, there's certainly a few exceptions, but generally they're being replaced uh, by the pit houses. Uh, the pit houses, um, are sort of disrespecting the general rhythm of the, the street and the architecture throughout East Arlington. Um, they're not you know, providing uh, for the kind of community interactions that can happen on the sidewalk because there is that, that in essence, dead zone um, in front of the house. I don't, I don't want all the streets you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now to be dominated by those kinds of developments. I don't want um, convex mirrors, I don't want flashing signs to warn people uh, of those walking by that uh, there are cars backing out that may in fact uh, be a hazard uh, to pedestrians coming by. Um, so I do, I do think this is an, a critical issue. I'm probably going to surprise a lot of people though um, and say I do plan on voting this down <laughs> um, simply because I think it's critical enough um, that it be studied some more. I think that there are it isn't just about restricting the slope of a driveway. Um, I think that we also need to look at uh, perhaps some incentives and other things that actually uh, incentivize developers and others who are redeveloping properties to put driveways on the sides, uh, to put garages um, towards the back, um, so that new houses um, 
are respecting roughly the fabric of the um, East Arlington neighborhood that exists throughout, throughout East Arlington with uh, driveways on the sides, garages in the back. I know perhaps that um, from a development perspective, that isn't creating two fee simple properties that two row houses um, produce. And when you're doing a single driveway with a garage um, in the back, um, you, you perhaps there isn't quite the same profit, but um, I, I could assure you that uh, any of the condominiums um, in the older homes that in fact aren't fee simple properties, they're not the side to side row houses, are, are selling like hotcakes throughout East Arlington. There's huge profits to be made. Um, and I think that uh, with a little more study um, that takes into account perhaps some of these slope issues, perhaps some other incentives, um, that I think the ARB in conjunction with the town meeting, uh, the planning department, um, zoning board of appeals, et cetera, we can develop um, some measures that we at town meeting can look at perhaps next year that I think are a little more uh, thought out. And again, I want to um, express my appreciation for some of these substitute motions that have uh, come up, but I think that there's more to be done um, to create a longer term solution to the issue of the pit houses. Um, and I'd like to see that perhaps done next year. Um, so I personally will be uh, voting no on the substitute amendment, but I have um, all the sympathies in the world for what it's trying to do, both from a pedestrian safety point of view and from an urban design point of view. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, Mr. Veraglu. Mustafa Veraglu, Precinct 10. I have a couple questions that have been touched on but not exactly answered. Um, so if this passes, I take it that this would become a, any house with such a driveway would become a non-conforming um, driveway at that time? Mr. And Heim? Mr. Heim, can you answer that? I'm sorry, I don't know a lot about these types of laws, so. <laughs> a few of these. Uh, Doug Heim, Town Council. I suppose uh, prior nonconformance can be a, a little bit of a complicated issue in and of itself, but uh, as a general matter, yeah, I'd assume that most of the driveways that are not in compliance with the current bylaw would, uh, with, with a change, would be, you know, in nonconforming status if there was some later construction that happened with respect to that same issue. Oh, okay, and my, my question really came down to if somebody wants to repave their driveway or otherwise in a sort of logical way, you know, do the sidewall of it, or I'm not talking about rebuilding the whole house or the whole driveway, but do the sort of maintenance people need to do every decade or two. Um, would that go to a zoning board, or what would be the implications for the people that actually own these properties already? I think I'd have to defer to the building inspector on that. Yeah, Mr. Byrne. Good evening, thank you. Uh, yeah, actually, today we're trying to figure out how it would all work. And I think with repaving, it would be the same grade would be there, and that, that would be fine. Um, I think it gets a little trickier if you're going to expand the driveway. Um, I think if you're going to, a lot of them are 10 feet now, you're going to be 20 feet, you want to make it 20 feet the maximum. That new part would, would I think, would have to be that maximum 15% grade. Um, or if you're going to extend it longer, that that would have to, I do believe, just like okay. any other zoning. And, and then my last question, and I'm not sure to who, but it's, um, I don't understand how something would be retroactively allowed or not allowed, and I understood if it's not compliant, it sounded like it would be allowed because it's, I don't understand that the, the statement was made that this would not be a retroactive action, but it's not actually written anywhere in the article. Mr. Heim? I'm sorry that I'm moving around podiums here. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Doug Heim, Town Council. I, I, think what the, I think the proponents and everyone else would agree that it, I think that the proponents and everyone else would agree that if you're changing the zoning bylaw, if something's not in conformance with that new zoning bylaw, with a new change, but it was but, but it was a pre-existing condition like that, it's not going to penalize somebody or tell them that they have to go and then change their driveway to make it comply with the new zoning bylaw. It, uh, its, its greatest effect would, might be on some folks who currently um, have a permit to do that kind of work, but, um, and it might retroactively affect those folks if they haven't already completed their work. But for everybody else, uh, it, it's essentially a grandfathered situation. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm still figuring this one out, but uh, 
I want to understand what the ramifications were if you already own one of these driveways or, or have um, people in your neighborhood that own them. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Ms. McCourt. Annie LaCourt, Precinct 15, I have three questions. Um, so my first question is, um, the proponent of the article alluded to the idea that the original request for this article for the redevelopment board to consider this topic came from the engineering department. If that's true, um, and Mike Rudemacher is here, any chance we could get a comment on that from DPW or from well, the ARB? Let's find out if that is actually the case. Um, and one of the planning. Okay. Sh sh uh, Mr. Burnell, where did the original idea for this come from? Andrew Burnell, Chair of the Redevelopment Board. The original idea for this article came from the Master Plan Implementation Committee, not from okay. the Town Engineering Department. Okay, but somewhere in here was the Engineering Department asked for an opinion. Did they have an opinion? I mean, you referenced the Engineering Department, so I'm just trying to get to the bottom of that. They were asked for an opinion, yes. Uh, and I'm not sure what that opinion was. I'll defer to Jenny Rate. Uh, actually, defer to either Jenny or Laura to answer that question. Okay. <laughs> Looks like Ms. Wiener is going to answer that for us. Laura Wiener, Assistant Director of Planning. Um, we asked the town engineer, and uh -huh. he said that he, he thought 15% was a, a reasonable number. Okay. So it was about just finding out whether this was a reasonable restriction. Okay. Um, so I guess my second question, and perhaps the building inspector can speak to this, is how many of these driveways have been built in, say, the last three years? Mr. Byrne, uh, do you have any idea? He has no or idea. Or the planning department? Okay. So we don't, we don't have any data about... No, not, not on hand, I don't know. Um, okay. How many new houses? Yeah, but not all of them had driveways that went under, right. um, I don't know. So no. we don't have a way of knowing if a new house is built that doesn't, isn't required to pull a special permit whether or not they're building a downslope driveway to a garage under? Currently, no, but we'd have to come up with a process. The way okay. We would, yeah. mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry, I'm leaning right into the mic. No, oh, you can hear me no. fine. Can you repeat your answer, Mr. Byrne, right into the microphone? Um, we, 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 I don't know how many houses that were built in the last three years have these types of driveways. Um, what was the rest of that? Have, no, I just was yeah. wondering if we had any idea if this was an accelerating yeah. problem yeah. with some urgency yeah, that I, I, a, I, waiting I, a year would be a problem. Yeah, and so. I, 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 I don't know again. It, okay. It's all numbers. And, all right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Um, my third question may be out of scope, moderator, um, uh, but I would like to ask... Um, uh, Mr. Bennell to speak to, since, since the subject of the idea that we need to look at the zoning bylaw as a whole with regards to residential properties was raised in the answer to one of the previous speaker's questions. I'm wondering whether or not the ARB has thought about how they're going to run that process and is able to commit to a time frame for doing that. Like, are we going to be able to see what they think are solid uh, modifications to that bylaw by next town meeting. That's kind of if it's way in scope. Out of scope. You Wait for like the scope determination. To answer that. It's out of scope. A real quick uh, answer. Andrew Brunel, chair of the redevelopment board. Uh, at the time, we don't have a timetable. I can assure you that the plan is as soon as time town meeting has finished and completed, and the board is back to its regular business. That we intend to put forth a work schedule uh, to put some sort of timetable in place. Uh, I can tell you it is my goal to have something reasonable before town meeting next year. And if I may be so bold as to ask one more question. Well, let's keep it within scope of this one. If you want to <laughs> well, find out what their work the schedule discussion. is, you're going to have to go to their meeting as soon as town meeting right. ends. Which I'll be this available at the break to answer forever. any questions. No, it's, the, it's information I want to get to the meeting, but if it's not in scope, it's not in scope. It's just an extension of this same discussion, John. So ask it. I'll see if it's in scope. Okay. So the question that I'm asking is, um, 
it, it would seem to me that this needs to be a public process that involves all the stakeholders and is going to be pretty intensive, like not just your regular meetings, but something extraordinary in order to come to a set of bylaws that are clear to all of us and clear to our constituents. So can you briefly? Well, I think all of the meetings have an agenda issued and they are all public meetings and I urge them to let everybody in town know by whatever means you have possible. But the question really is out of scope of this article. So they will, I assume, tell us all when it's going to happen and all give our all meetings sorts of are advertising. Publicized. All our agendas are made public at least 48 hours ahead of the meeting. And okay. okay, we'll talk at the break. You guys talk at the break. Um, let's take our five, ten minute, seven minute break. It's 9.35. Come back at 9.40. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Word in Precinct 8, and I shall only take a minute or a minute and 30 seconds, perhaps. I just wanted to point out to the, the town, fellow town meeting members that the master, master plan Speak right into the mic. Everybody here. The master plan implementation committee um, had this in their report that has been distributed to us that has not been changed, revoked, revised, or anything as far as I can tell. And it says, and I quote, um, uh, after talking about the, the uh, mixed use stuff, it says, and put some controls on the size of new housing development in residential neighborhoods to protect the existing character of neighborhoods throughout the town. MPIC endorsed those warrant articles 6 through 10. So uh, these are the people that the, have been appointed uh, by, directed by a vote of this body uh, to, to be the, the sort of guardians of the master plan. And they think you should pass this. Um, and I just want to say one other thing. If, for so, if you pass this and something doesn't work out, you can always change it. But if you don't pass it and some little kid is run down, could be your child, your grandchild, your godchild, some, any little kid is run down and killed or something, is that is going to be on your conscience and do you want to bear that burden? Thank you. Mr. Belkis. Well, Mr. Belkis was on the list, but he's not here, so. Mr. Berkowitz. Thanks, Mr. Moderator. Bill Berkowitz, Precinct 8. The key question in this article to me is one of applicability uh, and whether it applies to new construction or existing, existing driveways as well. The way I heard Mr. Heim answer Mr. Veroglu's question in the last before we broke is that uh, existing driveways would be exempted, they'd be grandfathered, uh, if that's correct. If that's the case, and this applies only to new, new construction, uh, then that seems to be eminently right and reasonable and a good reason to vote for the article which I intend to do and to encourage others here to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Slickman. Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9, motion to terminate debate on all items under this article. We have motion to terminate in this article and all, everything under it. That's been seconded. All in favor of terminating debate. We're going to use our clickers. One to terminate debate, two to not terminate debate. And vote. One to terminate debate, two not. To. Debate is terminated, 160 in the positive, 37 in the negative. We have before us a substitute motion of Ms. Pyle. All in favor of Ms. Pyle's motion, please vote one. If you do not want Ms. Pyle's motion, vote two. As soon as we're ready. 
Mr. Lathwood really figured this out. So one, if you want the substitute motion, two, if you do not. One, yes, two, no. <clears throat> it is in negative vote, 126 in the negative, 74 in the positive. We have now before us the recommended vote of the ARB of no action. All in favor of no action, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It's a vote of no action. That, that ends Article 10 and brings us to Article 11. We have before us a recommended vote of the ARB of no action. Mr. Oster. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Adam Oster, uh, Precinct 3, uh, and I'm going to actually say more about my neighborhood a little later, but I'm offering this uh, substitute motion. Um, two things really before I get started. Um, there's a slight change that I want to make when I make the motion. Uh, although if you, uh, if the moderator uh, prefers, I'll make it as an amendment to my motion and we can vote on both of them. The change is at the request of uh, the town manager in the very last paragraph of the Article 11 substitute motion that everyone got on their chairs, it says, uh, report on these issues at the next regular or special town meeting. Um, and uh, I'd like to delete the words, the next regular or special, so that it says, these issues at town meeting. I regret having to do this. From my point of view, I wish we had uh, this kind of legislation to vote on right now tonight. Uh, but uh, the town manager says that uh, he and his staff uh, can't necessarily do it by the fall when there very well might be a special town meeting. Uh, uh, so I feel obliged to take it out. Is that all right, Mr. Moderator? You can delete those words so that that last sentence will read these issues at town meeting. So we're going to get rid of those words. Correct? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Yes, that's exactly okay. what I was proposing. I also want to explain and maybe apologize a little bit for the unusual form of this article, which uh, uh, creates a, another committee. Uh, I don't really want to do that. We're blessed with many committees with jurisdiction over this, uh, some of which even meet regularly, and I don't want to layer on another one. But uh, I was advised that this is the correct way to uh, uh, keep it in scope with this article, is to make it a motion to commit. So just to be clear, uh, I'm not trying to set up another committee. Uh, I just want us to, if we agree, uh, give some direction to this process that's unfolding that's going to happen over the next year. I live. Uh, very far east Arlington in what's called the Hendersonville neighborhood. It's the, uh, on the north side of Mass Ave and back of the CVS, you, right by the Alewife Brook. And uh, it's, um, it's kind of a, historically anyway, a humble part of town. It's not a fancy kind of place. The, uh, it used to be the poor part of town. Uh, there used to be a lot of malaria there. Uh, there used to be, well, I, I won't, I won't uh, go into it too much. I don't want to run down my neighborhood either, which is a great place, but my point is it's not full of stately homes, and it's uh, you know, pretty small lots, and probably most of the houses there, which predate zoning, are non-conforming. Mine certainly is. Um, it's really, really close to the property line. Um, and it's interesting, because these are very basic houses, you know, pitched roof like a kid would draw, well, a little kid would draw, uh, front door. And in fact, I think the whole back half of the neighborhood from Teal Street to the cemetery is essentially the same house. Um, and I bet a hundred years ago, it looked like, you know, uh, the version of Levittown, the little boxes all in a row. Uh, but what's interesting is that what's happened uh, in the, uh, in, the, in that century is that people have changed their houses in little ways and now they're all different. I mean, they're all the same, but they're all different. They have, some of them have dormers, some of them have a big porch, some of them have different windows. And uh, 
architecturally, these just sort of work with each other really well, and it creates a very harmonious neighborhood. The, the buildings relate to the street in the same way. They relate to each other in the same way. And I think even if you had different style of building, uh, as long as it played by those rules, it would be fine. Um, we've had uh, five te teardowns in the past 10 years. Um, three of them in the last year, really, at least that's when they went on the market. I couldn't tell you exactly when the permits were pulled or anything like that. And some of these are not successful. Not because I don't like them as houses, not because they're bad, but because they don't fit in with the neighborhood. Uh, it's, sometimes it's size, it's not always size. It might be orientation to the street. There's one that doesn't have a front door on the street. Uh, which might be fine someplace else, but it doesn't work in our neighborhood. Um, uh, I'm not anti-teardown. Uh, I've, uh, I've testified in favor of at least one of these before the ARB. Uh, some of these are successful. Um, I know the builders can do this right. They're just not getting the right incentives to do it. None of these are McMansions, whatever that is. They're not big you know, mansion type houses, there are a lot of, some of them are duplexes, some of them are single family. Uh, none of them are evil. Any might fit into some neighborhoods. They just don't fit into mine. Uh, the trend is, will do real damage, I'm afraid, if we don't act. I was told at our precinct meeting that there are a bunch of these new houses in the pipeline. Um, Zoning is a, uh, a, a pretty technical thing. Uh, it's certainly beyond my competence. I feel like I can describe a problem pretty well. Uh, so my motion would turn this problem over to the professionals um, and uh, get all of these committees uh, sort of pulling in the same direction uh, and give them uh, a general mandate to get something before us uh, next year. I know uh, from, from uh, attending uh, the hearing, on the ARB hearing on these warrant articles and also a, a workshop that they held about zoning in general, that there are tools that are available to Arlington that other communities use to deal with these problems. Um, these include, for example, the use of overlay districts to specify requirements not by use as we do now, but by location. So we don't have to say, gee, every house in Arlington has to do this, or every single family has to do this. We could say, in this neighborhood, these rules apply. Now, is that a good idea? It kind of sounds like it, but I don't know. That's why I don't have a proposal to do it. Two minutes. Gotcha. Um, but just a proposal to consider it and to get back to us about it. Um, so. Here's my pitch, I guess. If you believe that the town has zero business telling you what to do on your property, if that's your position, you want to vote this down. But if you believe in an ethos of stewardship, if you think it's fair to say to people, leave the neighborhood as good as you found it, um, then I, think, I hope that you'll join me uh, in voting for this and forestalling what I see potentially as uh, a serious threat to at least some parts of town and the quality of life there. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Okay. Did we get a second on his proposal? Okay, thank you. Seconded. Um, Mr. Burnell. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Andrew Burnell, Chair of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. Uh, I can speak for myself, as, uh, and, and I want to thank Mr. Oster for his substitute motion. I think this accomplishes uh, some of what you've heard me talk about over the last several nights as far as a need to involve all the stakeholders in town, uh, make sure that whatever zoning is being done is being done right and fits uh, the master plan, fits the town goals, and fits Arlington as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mrs. Warden.
Patricia Warden, Precinct 8. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Fellow town meeting members, Arlington is a very crowded and land poor town, presenting problems and confrontations among builders and realtors versus advocates of open space and quality of life issue for neighborhoods. Hopefully, a committee, as was maybe suggested under this article, will so help solve some of those problems. There is also competition between officials who want to raise revenues for the town by building more and more housing versus those who look longer term, realizing that the cost of new school buildings, if any land can even be found for them, could cripple the town in the long run. Many of us would like to leave technical matters to the experts. This proposed Article 11 committee or whatever group is suggested, which I strongly support if properly appointed, balanced and monitored, might be composed largely of experts, but these experts would also include members who are known to have the good of residents at heart, in addition to familiarity, of course, with the zoning bylaw. The selection of members will be key to the success of whatever action occurs from this article. We in Arlington are coming late to the teardown control efforts in other nearby towns, such as Winchester, Belmont, Lexington, and Wellesley. Planning departments seeing the damage done by a teardowns to neighborhoods have themselves taken care to initiate and implement zoning protections and already have these in place. Since our redevelopment board has not put any protection whatsoever in place, this Article 11 actions, if you vote uh, favorably tonight, will hopefully do so. That is why it is so important. It would function almost as a planning department for the teardown issue. When a clinical study is conducted of a drug's efficacy or something like that, the results of the study may become compelling much before the scheduled end date of the study. For instance, if there are a large number of deaths from this drug use, in that case, in order to benefit or protect patients. These results might be taken immediately into account in clinical practice without waiting for the appointed study end date. With Arlington's more than two years of master plan study, it became abundantly clear very early on from hundreds of residents that serious damage is being done to our neighborhoods by teardown rebuilds, but nothing was done. There was no interest from the redevelopment board during the entire two years of the study. Even after we voted approval of the master plan a year ago here at town meeting, there was still nothing done by the redevelopment board. Eventually, six months after the master plan approval, some of us became afraid that if no zoning changes to protect our neighborhoods were prepared for this annual town meeting, then another whole year would go by, and it would be 2017 before we could get any relief. And so our goal was to work with the redevelopment board to solve this turret on rebuild problem and at their suggestion, we conferred multiple times with their staff to design appropriate zoning articles. However, the redevelopment board never really discussed the articles with us. A few moments at most were allowed us on their agenda, nor did they let us know what their intentions were. It was a very disappointing experience. We had no idea we would have to work without them. They simply ran out the clock on us. And so we were, with, we were forced to file our articles and go alone in order to meet the deadline for filing warrant articles. Now, of course, with the loss of our major Article 15, there cannot be any slowdown in the teardown rebuilds until 2017 at the earliest, by which time the builder-broker teardown cartels will have ruined more neighborhoods. There are many millions of dollars involved here. For these mansion operators, um, they unlock the wealth in Arlington houses for themselves and leave us with scarred and mutilated neighborhoods where average people can no longer afford to buy a home while the teardown cartel operators take the wealth to some place, whatever, like, maybe like Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago or who knows. According to the bylaws of the town, the responsibilities of the Arlington Redevelopment Board in implementing zoning include, and I quote, to provide adequate light and air, to prevent overcrowding of land, to avoid undue concentration of population, to encourage housing for persons of all income levels, to protect and preserve open space, and that redevelopment of land should be made with reasonable consideration of the character of the district, etc., etc. Nowhere, nowhere can we find that it is the duty of town officials to maximize opportunity, feasibility, and profits for teardown developers. And yet, that is what the redevelopment board has been doing by willingness to provide only baby steps to protect residents from harmful construction, and after intensive false propaganda from developer, realtor, teardown operators, the redevelopment board even decided to withdraw their own baby steps and to cancel the residential zoning articles designed by their own staff, endorsed by the Master Plan Implementation Committee. They did that just an hour before town meeting started. 
the redevelopment board simply rejected as confusing, as confusing Two all minutes. that residential zoning work that they had recently praised to the heavens as being a wonderful job worked on for many months by their staff and the Master Plan Implementation Committee. And so the town has been left without any protection, remaining a cash cow for to turn on operators and brokers. This proposed committee can change that. The uh, Arlington Redevelopment Board members should not be faulted for their attitudes. They are what they are, and they just happen to be very much pro-developer. Let's keep they are it doing civil. the first-rate job, serving those whom they consider to be their most important constituency, the real estate development community. However, the advisors to the Redevelopment Board appointing authority have failed to achieve a balanced board. As a former member of the Human Rights Commission, in fact, I was a charter member, of that commission. I think it's important to recognize the rights of all Arlington residents to a reasonably stable quality of life and environment. Those rights should not be subjugated to the rights of developers. The proposed Article 11 committee, if dominated by current redevelopment board members and representatives of the development realtor community, will end up in 2017 as we have this year with no protection. We must have a well-balanced committee to bring us real protective reform, not just window dressing. Please vote yes for this committee. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Belkis. John Belkis, Precinct 18. Uh, I'm a little intrigued with, with this amendment. Uh, I haven't quite, quite made up my mind. Uh, some of the things that are going through my head, though, is uh, I want to see if there are any more real estate people that want to speak to this argument because uh, every article we've had about these has involved the real estate people in town, uh, which I find kind of interesting. A lot of the work that was done on these articles, and I was part of the group that worked on them, were based on contacts with other towns, and some of these were mirror image. We met numerous times with the redevelopment board. Uh, we thought there were some good things going here because there was a lot of concern. I had a personal concern because one of these things was built right next door to me. And believe me, everyone should have the experience of having a tear down and a new house replace the property next to them. I mean, it is frightening. Uh, when power trucks show up at seven o'clock in the morning, uh, diesel engines, uh, it's just out of control. Uh, it's kind of fascinating that it, the real estate let's development Let's keep within people, the scope of the article. Pardon? I, I think we're, we, we, let's keep all our discussions on everybody out on the scope of this article, okay. whether we like Mr. Oster's amendment or not, not onto the issue of teardowns. I didn't have a chance to interject that during Mrs. Warden's okay. speech. <laughs> um, but let's keep I it guess, to the scope I guess my of the article. Is I support I, I probably support this, though I don't have much hope for it because it's something that I've seen before where committees are organized. We got some people that supposedly very experienced in, in zoning uh, that put these articles forth and it's kind of frightening that all of a sudden they took them away and at the same time we were getting uh, flyers in the mail. I got letters from the Greater Boston Real Estate Board these things were done in other towns, and I didn't see the Greater Boston Real Estate Board sending out correspondence to all the town meeting members and the neighborhoods. Uh, it just Scope. strikes me as strange. Scope. Uh, Pardon? Scope. Back into, do you like Mr. his article? Do you want the committee or not? What's bad about the committee? What's good about it? Not the Greater Boston Real Estate Board. Okay, I, I guess I just want to make the point we seem to have some strange it's a resolution. Voices speaking against these. I'm speaking for them. Uh, it's something to be considered, and I will vote for this amendment. Thank you, sir. Yeah, we're just talking about a resolution to set up a committee. Mr. Jameson. Oh, you're Mr. McCabe. Mr. Jameson, Mr. McCabe. You're soon. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jameson, Precinct 12. I learned last time that I'll leave uh, that to Mr. McCabe. Um, okay, so some history. If I understand it, about three years ago, we started a master planning process. Many of those of you in the room who've been in town and many people who are at home took part in that process. 
And last year, on the last day of town meeting, as the last thing we voted on, I believe, we adopted the master plan. Now, um, sort of under the radar is the master plan implementation committee report to town meeting. Um, and um, I really, Mr. Oster is one of my favorite members of town meeting. Uh, he really is. He he's, he's, um, often brings up uh, extremely insightful comments that, that turn me on articles. Unfortunately, Adam, um, I'm against you on this one. So, and the reason I'm against is because if you look at this report, which speaks directly to the type of committee that's implementing the master plan that is set to address these issues as expressed and as referenced by many of the proponents of the articles that have been before us over the last God knows how many hours. Um, this committee had to be convened after town meeting. That took until October. Um, they, they have been very thoughtful. I know uh, one of the members personally, Mr. Um, Howard, who's on, uh, one of, on two of the other committees I serve on, and he's also a finance committee member. Um, they've set out a, a really aggressive, I think, comprehensive approach towards implementing over the next 10 to 15 years the master plan, which includes so many articles. If you go to page two, there's a large paragraph if you have this in front of you, basically says during the coming year, the committee in conjunction with the ARB is going to oversee the rewriting of the new zoning bylaw known as recodification. And as I spoke earlier and others have spoken earlier, the last time this was done was 1975. So hence, um, I believe that the master plan implementation committee is the committee that is, that is tasked already by the town to do this and with all due respect again to Mr. Oster, um, I don't think we need another committee. We have one. Uh, that having been said, all those who are very interested in these, these activities should become part of the um, working groups if that's possible and attend as many meetings as possible. I hope that we have a large series next year of monthly meetings for people who, to come and learn about zoning and what we can do um, to come up with this comprehensive recodification that we will be able to work, work, hopefully vote through next year at town meeting. So um, thank you very much, Ms. Moderator. Thank you. This gentleman back there in the white shirt, and yeah, you have your hand up? Yes, you did. Len Carden, Precinct 20. Um, as we look at this motion, I, I'm all for committees and everybody coming together to look at, look at issues. But what bothers me is the assumption, the assumption that there is a problem. And you know, zoning bylaw amendments require two thirds of this body's support. And while I agree that some of these houses that have gone up, the duplexes in East Arlington and the one uh, next to the previous speaker are out of character with the neighborhoods, I'm not certain that we have consensus in town that it really is a serious problem that requires action and that will, that will get a two-thirds majority in this body. So we spent two full nights debating these articles and it's been good time, we've had good discussions, but in voting on this, don't just, don't just look at it as sending something to a committee. If you do think there's an, there's an issue with these homes, then vote yes. If you're not sure, or you want to defer to the ARB and to the Master Planning Committee, then vote no. I, I really don't want everybody sending a message. Like We've had so many people cite the Master Plan, but we also had everybody tell us last year the Master Plan was non-binding. So um, just think about this carefully before you vote whether or not there is this issue. Thank you. This woman over here on the right, yep. Do you have your hand up, Miss? With yeah, you just moved through. You, you, you yeah. Did you have your hand up? Ah, oh, sir. Ah, oh, wrong. <laughs> he, she said it was a guy, and I thought by your hair. Jeez, I feel embarrassed now. Sorry. That wasn't civil. <laughs> I have glasses. I can't see that far. I got to get them fixed. Good evening, Andrew Bankson, uh, Precinct Seven. All right. How's this? Good. All right. 
So um, I support the substitute motion, um, and that will give the ARB, the planning department, and the town manager more time to develop a more comprehensive uh, zoning reform. And uh, I think they could use a little help. Um, you can, uh, the past couple of nights, we've, we've, uh, we've maybe been short on visuals. Um, no one knows, you know, whether it's 30 feet or 25 feet or, you know, 25 and, and, and made up of 10 and 15. And, you know, so I think that, um, you know, something that is more comprehensive visually would be helpful. So I have a couple of questions, Mr. Moderator. Um, yes, sir. And um, so I'm wondering, would it be useful to have a, a summer intern uh, test the code on several sites around town, and then once they're tested, create visualizations of the allowable building massing? And maybe they could also document uh, buildings, take measurements, photos of um, typical older houses, and then also the newer build-outs um, or the pit houses. So that would be the first question. Would it be, would anyone find that useful? Oh, you want me to pull the crowd? Oh, I don't know. I, I was can't. just wondering, maybe, um, how well, about- Mr. Bunnell, would you find that useful in your studies? Andrew Bunnell, Chair of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. I would find that useful. Okay, Super now we just got to find the money. But, that's my <laughs> second question. Um, so, uh, so then, um, oh, you, 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 you already asked the question then. So, uh, so, but relatively short money, um, they could do these tests without pulling resources away from the ARB or the planning department. Can these be these funds somewhere uh, be found? Can they be made available? Um, Jenny, do you have that in your budget? <laughs> Mr. Rate says no. <laughs> Maybe Mr. Chapterlink can find an intern somewhere for us. Some architectural school guy for free. Adam Chaplin, town manager. But <clears throat> before I could, excuse me, before I could commit to saying yes, we'd have the funding. I think we'd have to scope out exactly what we're doing. There are yeah. some planning funds available, but you know, a, a large-scale visualization, probably no. Uh, but I, I think we could get creative and, and see what we can do. Yeah, I'm thinking um, something along the lines of a summer intern. You know, two months. Anyway, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a, a big uh, well, a, a number. He, he, well, maybe it would. I don't know. Uh, Adam Chaplin, town manager. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that a, a summer intern um, would necessarily have the skills we're looking for to put together a sort of the, the, the comprehensive, really, you know, easy, easy to use, uh, utilize visualizations. But if, if you have any suggestions of, of an intern, I'd be happy, be happy to hear it. All right, cool. Uh, I'll talk to you later. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Revelac. Steve Revelock, 111 Sunnyside Avenue, Precinct 1. Um, I echo some of Adam's sentiments. I live on Sunnyside Avenue, which is, I guess you could call it Far East Arlington. If it were any further east, we'd be in the alewife, um, which we sometimes are from time to time. The, <laughs> the character of my neighborhood is really uh, small row houses. There were 80 of them built in 1948. And since, um, much like Adam's neighborhood, they started off the same, and then they changed in their own quirky ways. You know, you could tell it was all the same house, but they're all, now they're a little different. Now, obviously, my neighborhood is different Ten. than, oh. you know, the houses you'd see, say, between Broadway and Mass Ave. And it's completely different than what you would see on Jason Street or Let's keep uh, it to the scope Pleasant. of the article. Yes, yeah, so I do, have, I do have two questions regarding, um, you know, the... the proposed committee. One is how would it overlap with the current master plan implementation committee? Um, it's sort of going back to Gordon's point. And the second, uh, the master plan mentions something called an architectural protection district, uh, an APD, where I guess the idea was to, it seemed like the idea was to you know, have maybe different architectural design guidelines for different areas of town to, I guess, preserve local neighborhood character. I, what I'm just wondering is, would there be overlaps between either of those two bodies and the body being proposed here? Thank you. Mr. Chapdelaine, can you address those? 
try a new podium. Uh, Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. I've had some uh, discussions with uh, the planning director, Ms. Raitt, uh, on this issue. Frankly, I, I think I would utilize the existing master plan implementation committee either, either, uh, excuse me, either as the committee or as uh, an overseer of a, of a separate larger committee to broaden the stakeholders to, to look at this issue. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Carl Wagner, Precinct 11. Um, I used to live in Henderson Street. Uh, I think Adam's uh, substitute motion makes a lot of good sense. I, I'd uh, draw your attention to two towns, two cities, a tale of two cities even, um, Lexington and Arlington. Uh, sometimes we think, oh, Lexington is so much more, whatever, it's west of us. And uh, those houses in those streets on that Scope. town are actually facing Scope the same the problem. Article. Henderson and other streets we know have houses put in sideways effectively. They have people living in them, great people I'm sure, but the, the, the situation I've seen is happening in many communities. If you voted against the measures that were put through earlier in the session this year that would have tried to bring some rationality to the process of keeping the town feeling like our town, uh, then I'd suggest you should consider voting yes on this. If this committee is in fact duplicating what the, uh, what the uh, existing um, master plan committee is going to do or a group will do, then we can dissolve it. But um, as, as, as people have said, we need to think more seriously about what we're going to do before we take individual actions. And if you voted against the individual actions this time, let's, let's, let's use this committee as a chance to make that uh, bigger decision together. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yep. No, no. Behind you. Your hand just went up. You're down. Uh, Debbie Edelstein, Precinct 9. I had two, um, I had a comment and a question. The comment was, as much as I support um, the, uh, the, the uh, sentiment in this particular um, substitute motion, I've been troubled all week about motions that have things in them that are become omnibus motions and have things in them that I can't support even though I might support the principle. In this case, there's a lot of editorializing that's part of the motion instead of part of a background. And I'm not, I personally don't necessarily find it appropriate to, to vote for a resolution with that amount of editorializing, even if I agree with it. Um, and the second thing is I just want to agree with some of the people who came ahead of me. I thought we had a master plan implementation committee for this, and so it seems like the appropriate place for it, um, although I support the sentiment of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. McCabe, you're next. Mark McKay, Precinct 2. I stand to terminate debate on Article 11 and all matters before it. We have a motion to terminate debate on Article 11 and all matters before it. It's been seconded. All in favor of terminating debate, press 1 when the light goes on. If you do not want to terminate debate, press 2. And click. 1 to terminate debate, 2 to continue talking. It is terminated 174 in the positive, 22 in the negative. We have now before us Mr. Oster's substitute motion. 20. Excuse me? It's a resolution setting up a committee, as far as I can figure. So we have before us Mr. Oster's substitute motion. If you want Mr. Oster's substitute motion, please vote yes. If you do not want it, vote Two for no. <laughs> Mr. 
It is a positive vote, 107 in the affirmative, 95 in the negative. We now have a force a recommended vote of the ARB as substituted by Mr. Oster's vote. All in favor, please vote one for yes, two for no. We have to take two votes. We have to be voted, now we're voting as amended. So now we have to vote, we have to take two votes. So, yeah. No, this is just setting up a committee and a resolution. So all in favor, please vote one for yes, two for no. Okay, 118 in the affirmative, 85 in the negative. We made another committee. <laughs> Good luck, Mr. Chaplain. That ends the bait on number 11, and that brings us now to number 30. We have before us a recommended vote of the no of the um, Board of Selectmen of no action on number 30. Some of your, pe your b make sure your um, recommended vote actually says that no action be taken under Article 30. There may be some typos in some of your reports. We're not sure how that happened. If it says 25, make it say 30. All in favor of recommended vote of no action of the Board of Selectmen under number 30, please say yes. yes. All opposed, say no. That is a positive vote of no action. That terminates Article 30 and brings us to Article 31, acceptance of local option taxes. Mr. Um, Tosti, are you going to report on Article 31? This is one of those articles where we thought the selectmen were going to do it. They thought we were going to do it. Uh, so there's no report in your, um, in your packets. Um, but there's been no... Uh, new revenues or new regulations allowing us to raise any additional money, fees, anything like that. Therefore, uh, the Finance Committee recommends no action. We have, of course, a recommended vote of the Finance Committee on Article 31 of no action. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? It is unanimous vote of no action. I so declare it. That terminates the Article 31. It brings us to Article 32. Endorsement of CBGB applications. Mr. Um, Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Dan Dunn, uh, Vice Chair of the Board of Selectmen this year, and I serve on the CDB, CDBG subcommittee uh, with uh, Selectman Stephen Byrne. Uh, this, for those of you who do not know, the CDBG is the Community Development Block, grant, block Fund Grant, which comes directly from the federal government to us. Um, it is then allocated by a vote of six people, which is the Board of Selectmen plus the town manager. Uh, it actually is an unusual pot of money because it is not subject to town meeting um, official uh, approval, but we come here for feedback and uh, seeking your blessing for the choices that we've made. We do a uh, public hearing where we receive requests from uh, the various applicants, and then we do uh, at least two subcommittee meetings where we review the various uh, uh, proposals and we weigh them against each other and try to make the uh, make some hard choices. The reason the choices are hard is because the requests for the money are vastly exceed the amount of money that is available uh, in the CDBG grant. It's worth noting uh, that the grant gets smaller every year, and so while the the needs you know do not seem to get smaller, but the amount of money available does. The um, the money is distributed in, uh, according to some of the need categories that you see out written into the report, and we operate within restrictions about how much can be put forward to any specific category. So in particular, the public services category is the one that is uh, the most hotly requested and in high demand, and we give the most we can to that to the dollar, but, uh, and, then, uh, and then some of the other ones we, we balance out against it. One more consideration is just that last year, uh, what we did, we went through 
some of the past allocations from many previous years, and we repurposed them. So the amount of money that we put forward last year was significantly larger than we were able to put forward this year uh, because you know that repurposing that we did last year was essentially a one-time uh, fund. So uh, with all that said, I ask for your uh, support for the allocations of the CDBG. You have a question, ma'am? Hi, Linda Hanson, Precinct 7. Just for your consideration um, going forward, I would be interested in seeing a little more historical perspective, maybe a couple of years, just to see how things have shifted and gotten bigger or smaller in different areas over time. So just that suggestion. Thank you. Anyone else wish to discuss CBGB money? Mr. Um, Klein? Christian Klein, Precinct 10, just sorry, just a very quick question. Um, under administration number two, grants administrator salary and benefits, um, the request was for 65,000, but the grant was for 84, and I just wanted to know why that was increased beyond what was requested. Mr. Dunn? Oh, Ms. Ray? Jennifer Raitt, Planning and Community Development Director. In, uh, at the time that the applications were being put forward, including by my staff for general planning and administration, we were thinking that that particular uh, position would be funded in part by CDBG and possibly in part by the Community Preservation Act. Um, during the course of time that we were re reviewing the applications and putting the budget together, we learned that that was not gonna be possible. So that's why the allocation is higher, all coming from Community Development Block Grant funds. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> Seeing none, all in favor of the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? It is a positive vote, and I so declare it. That terminates Article 32 and brings us to Article 33. Mr. Chapterling. Revolving funds. <clears throat> Adam Chapterling, town manager. Uh, you'll see in the board's report, the report on revolving funds. These are the, uh, the annual report where a town meeting authorizes the expenditure limits for all of these revolving funds. Uh, revolving funds are basically program funds where we collect fees uh, for a certain program and then are able to pay expenditures related to the uh, implementation of those programs. Uh, so you have in the selectmen's re report the beginning balance, receipts, expenditures, and then the ending balance at the end of last fiscal year, and there was also distributed via the town meeting member email list and placed on your chairs a more detailed report about the actual expenditures uh, in each fund last year. Be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Any fun, um, questions on revolving funds? Seeing none, all in favor to recommend a vote of the Board of Selectmen, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? It's a unanimous vote, and I so declare it. That terminates Article 33 and brings us to Article 34. Uh, position reclassifications. Um, anybody have questions about position reclassifications? Seeing none, all in favor of the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen to position reclassification, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? It's a unanimous vote, and I so declare it. That terminates Article 34 and brings us to Article 35. What's this, Article 36? Appropriations, town budgets. Anyone want to talk about town budgets? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to present first? Or you want me to go through them first, Mr. Um, Tosti? Okay. Mr. Tosti's floating the idea of whether we should bypass the budgets now so we can spend a, a good part of a full day on them and just work on other warrant articles. Mr. Chaplain, did you have an opinion? Yeah. Adam Chaplain, uh, town manager, certainly um, willing to listen to the, the will of the body, but I've had department heads here specifically uh, expecting that budgets would come up tonight, and I think it would be a shame to lose that opportunity to at least begin the discussion. Okay, so we could. 
Al, do you want to make a motion or not? No? Okay. Well, I guess he's not going to make a motion to postpone. So what we do on the budget, so I'm going to read through the budgets. If anyone wants to discuss one of the particular budgets you'll hold, and we get through all the budgets, we'll only go back and discuss the ones where someone has yelled hold. So if you've all looked at them, I'm going to start now. Finance Committee. Board of Selectmen. Hold on the Board of Selectmen. Finance? Mr. Jamison, hold on finance. Any Board of Selectmen? Town Manager? Human Resources? Information Technology? Comptroller? Treasurer Collector? Postage? Board of Assessors, Legal, Town Clerk, Board of Registrars, Parking, Planning and Community Development, Redevelopment Board, Zoning Board of Appeals, Old. Public Works. <laughs> Facilities. Old. Community Safety. Old. Inspections. Old. Old. Education. Libraries. Health and Human Services. Retirement. Insurance. Hold. Reserve funds. Water and so oh, water and s oh, now we're in the Appendix B, water and sewer. Recreation. Oh, these are um, small budgets. Ed Burns Arena. Hold. Council on Aging, Transportation, and Youth Services. Okay. Now we'll go back and discuss the couple we know we're going to talk about. Finance Committee. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jamison, Precinct 12, my pen. Um, first, I want to thank the Finance Committee for their work. I think we should all give them a round of applause. Um, and, uh, you know, given that our budget is in the $140 million range, I would ask in future years that the uh, Finance Committee consider that perhaps it's time for the town to foot half the bill for Town Day and half the bill for the Patriots Parade and give some more consideration to the art project, which was uh, given a, a motion of no action. But beyond that, I thank them very much. Thank you very much. Anyone else wish to discuss Finance Committee? Mr. Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Carl Wagner, Precinct 11. I don't know if this is in scope. I hope it is because I just heard the parade mentioned. Um, I donated money to the parade and was told it is not a taxable, uh, sorry, a tax uh, savings possibility for me. And I think that if we do want the citizens of the town to support the parade, I hope we will have a charity set up for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else in the fin FinCom? Mr. Gilligan? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Stephen Gilligan, Town Treasurer. I want to c correct the previous speaker. Contributions to Town Day are tax deductible under new IRS guidelines. How about the parade? 
It's a public service that's not a typical municipal service to residents. It is also tax deductible. Oh, cool. Okay, anyone else in the FinCom? Seeing none, we're gonna jump to town manager. Who wanna to discuss the town manager? Mr. Leonard? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Leonard, Precinct 17. Mr. Moderator, it is my understanding that uh, Deputy Town Manager Andrew Flanagan left last year for a new post and was officially gone from the town in October 1st. It is also my understanding then that from October 1st to January of this year, we did not have a deputy town manager. Due to the calculations I roughly put together, we budgeted last year for the deputy town manager for the fiscal year $116,000. Could somebody please tell me that for the three months that we did not have a deputy town manager, averaging out to be $9,680 a month to the tune of $29,000. Where did that $29,000 go where we did not have a deputy town manager to give it to? Mr. Chapdelaine? Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Any unexpended funds in, in any appropriation at the end of the year would uh, roll into free cash. Okay. My next question, Mr. Moderator, is could somebody tell me the difference between a deputy town manager and an assistant town manager? Mr. Chapdelaine? Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Um, as you can see in the Finance Committee report, the assistant town manager is a proposed new position this year. Um, the differences I would lay out are that here in Arlington, the deputy town manager, uh, though having comprehensive duties, uh, is a de facto finance director with a lack of a consolidated finance department. Uh, so there, there are very many financial responsibilities that fall to the deputy town manager. Uh, what we are looking at for this assistant town manager is more of an operational um, community, um, community affairs based role, uh, looking at serving as a liaison between uh, various departments and citizens, working on uh, implementing capital projects, uh, actually especially CPA projects that don't have a department overseeing them, uh, serving as a public records officer. We anticipate the passage of a new public records law that will require the designation of a public records officer. That's something I see this new uh, position doing. Uh, as well as doing other various project management responsibilities. So one, uh, more succinctly, the deputy town manager uh, would have um, comprehensive yet very specific financial roles, and the assistant town manager would have more uh, directly operational roles. Mr. Moderator, if I read this right, meaning no disrespect whatsoever to Mr. Poor, who has joined us in the town of Arlington, as of January of this year. After four months on the job, we're going to give him a raise of $6,000. Is that the way I understand this report? I see a raise in the position of 6,237. I don't know what his deal was when he was hired or if he's getting a raise at this point or not. Mr. Chapdelaine's gonna tell us what's going on. Adam Chaplain, town manager, uh, we, we certainly negotiated compensation with Mr. Pooler before hiring him. One thing that affects, though, that year-over-year -year look is in FY16, the current fiscal year, there was collective bargaining uh, and cost of living increases appropriated in a separate warrant article. Uh, the total amount appropriated last year was 700000 Those are not allocated into the FY16 year. Uh, but in FY17, basically, you get the cost of living increase that would have been appropriate in FY16 plus what would be appropriate in FY17. Uh, so it, there's a lar appears to be a larger increase than there actually is based on the way the budget is being presented. 
My only point, Mr. Moderator, and I do not want to offend anybody, is that getting a $6,000 raise, as I see it, after four months on the job is doing pretty good. My last question is basically, I feel a little bit uncomfortable with this because I've seen in other departments that there is mention of assistance to directors in other departments. And I'm just worried that now we might be setting a president that all departments are going to possibly entertain the idea of not only getting deputies, but assistants in the future. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Deist? Pass. Anyone else with to discuss the town manager? Mr. Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Carl Wagner, Precinct 11. Um, I wish to ask a question, uh, Mr. Moderator, about uh, amounts that are in the detail of personnel services, town manager, 2016 to 2017. And before I, I ask you to tell me if you can what that, that increase is about, I want to say that I and some others uh, may have had some uh, concerns from an advocate article that talked about um, um, maybe a contract and then some large increase in the in the in the offer that was made to the town manager position. I'm glad to see that that large increase is, is lower there, but uh, I guess I would just like to ask uh, the town to explain to this body and to the people watching what exactly happened over the, the raise for 2017, please. Ms. Mahan. Diane Mahan, Chairman of the Board of Selectmen. Um, as succinctly as possible, and I'll elaborate if anyone wants to, and many of you are probably aware of this, uh, the town manager informed the Board of Selectmen that um, he had received, entertained, and was about to accept an offer in an, another community. Um, the Board of Selectmen, under the f uh, previous chair, uh, called for a, a meeting to discuss the, the, this very important issue as well as what it is the uh, combined Board of Selectmen wanted to do on that. We were very unanimous that um, losing Mr. Chapdelaine at this point in time with all the important projects uh, that the town is facing in terms of uh, b schools and buildings and uh, the long range planning committee and looking at the operating budget and all his institutional knowledge um, that we really would just basically be left with um, in, in my opinion, in dire straits. So in an effort to uh, look at the town manager and exactly what his job um, has really grown into, and um, sometimes I said to him, you're the, a victim of your own success um, because he really was doing the job, in my personal opinion, of two or three people. The Board of Selectmen sat down, um, looked at uh, what it is we expected of this town manager at this time and felt very strongly we couldn't afford to uh, lose him. So it was a three or four pot package. Um, one was the assistant town manager position, which since I've been on the board, every town manager previous to Mr. Chapdelaine had a deputy and assistant. And if you think of when I first got on the board in 99 to what the duties of a town manager are now, um, they have surpassed and, and expanded. Um, the other thing was uh, financial compensation uh, in terms of uh, what we would, would offer the town manager. Uh, we felt that, m myself personally, I felt that um, what we presented to him and he accepted um, was de definitely something that he was worthy of as well as he is, you know, in my opinion, the top um, management professional in the town. Uh, and, and then there were uh, a few other uh, areas that, you know, didn't necessarily involve um, fin financial. So what it was is um, in order to retain the town manager, to me and my colleagues, this was never about money, but that was like one-fourth of the pie. And so, you know, we looked at um, comparable communities because Arlington is a town, but it's really at the top of the echelon of the town. Myself, I looked at, you know, the superintendent of school salary, the board amongst ourselves um, had a discussion and then we authorized the chairman to go down and uh, no negotiate with certain para parameters, of course taking into 
kind of double checking in the financial background um, that we had the ability to make the offer that we hoped and were successful to keep Mr. Chapdelaine. Thank you very much. I uh, don't mean any disrespect to any individuals uh, that are involved. I simply was shocked to see um, what seemed like a, a quick handout, and I hope that there'll be uh, financial measures to restrict uh, or at least control that in the future. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Dice, did you want to speak? Yep. John Dice, Precinct 13, um, as, and a member of the Finance Committee. As a member of the Finance Committee, uh, I and the other members of the Finance Committee have an awful lot to do with, uh, with the town manager. And in my opinion, he is an absolutely superb manager of this town. This town has run very, very well. Uh, he was almost a whirling dervish last year, I thought. I didn't understand how he even managed to do what he did. So I think this is well deserved. Uh, last year, he was late, making less money than some of the people he managed. So I think this is very well deserved, along with a good plan now for uh, allotting some of the responsibilities to uh, the, the new people he, that have been brought on board. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. And I hope you will certainly support uh, this, uh, this budget. Ms. Memon. Serena Memon, Precinct um, 21. I have some questions just because um, I applaud uh, the town manager doing a great job. I think uh, he's a valuable asset to the town. I think we're getting a more clearer picture, thankfully, due to him. But I wanted to know, um, the expenses have stayed the same. If you look at the expenses of the others, like the finan FinCom Committee or Finance Committee, as well as Board of Selectmen, I was wondering, why are this number same over from 2014 to 2017, and what is it about? Mr. Um, Tosti? They didn't ask for any more. I'm sorry? <laughs> they didn't ask for any more. Oh, okay. And the, the uh, expenditures were in the proper range, so uh, we left it alone. I understand, but I was wondering, um, did they spend less than that amount, possibly, or is that a uh, variation not uh, 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 in, in present in the town manager's office with expenses? When we vote the budgets, we vote a bottom line. Uh, if you'll give me a minute. So, you know, sometimes the expenses were higher, sometimes they might have been lower. Uh, 14 and 15, they were higher, um, often from having to hire uh, consultants to deal with specific issues but um, on that. But uh, if they're not going to ask for more money, we're sort of hesitant. Okay, to so give they them. may do with Unless what they it's have. something where they're deliberately low volume gas or. Uh, heat, light, electricity, stuff like that. Okay. Uh, but that's what they requested. It was reasonable. That's what we off, uh, recommended to you. Okay. I'll just leave it. Um, number two question would be, what is steps? It's base salary plus steps. What does that mean under details of personnel services? Everybody in the, uh, in the town, um, they usually come in at a, at a base salary, mm -hmm. and then they have steps. Could be any place from five to seven steps oh, over a period of time. Uh, so they might start off at 70,000 and then the steps are usually in the four to five percent range um, and then they'll get to the max and then that's it. After they get to the max, 
uh, all they get is a COLA. Uh, all they get is what? A COLA, a cost of living raise. Oh, I see, okay. And what is longevity? I noticed that it went up to about double from 2015 to 2016, and then it's going down in 2017. Yep. Uh, longevity is sort of a uh, reward for lasting long enough. Oh, I see. Uh, <laughs> you know, if, you, if you're here for five years, you get a certain longevity. If, if you're here for 10 or for 15 or for 20. Uh, and, and that'll vary uh, depending upon who's coming and who's going. And lastly, uh, other benefits, it seems like they're increasing by th about three times from 2016 to 2017. And they've gone up from 2014 about four times plus. Uh, most of that are uh, benefits for the manager. Uh, the last one was a housing allowance that he was, uh, that he was awarded by the Board of Selectmen. Uh, if they wish, they could talk to that a little bit more. Um, but uh, um, that's what that is. I'd like to hear a little bit about the housing benefit for the town manager from the selectmen, please. Uh, Ms. Oh, Mr. Dunn's going to speak to that. Elaborating on what uh, Chairwoman, Chairwoman Mahan, uh, sorry, Dan Dunn, uh, Vice Chair of the Board of Selectmen, uh, elaborating on what uh, Chairwoman Mahan said earlier about the negotiation. Uh, <coughs> As a board, we evaluate it, uh, um, Adam very highly. And one of the things, in, we, and you get that feedback from a variety of sources. You get it from the department heads, you get it from the people who are in. Uh, the, I understand, the, Mr. Dunn. Yeah. I just want to know what, what that would entail, the we, benefits. We uh, gave, part of the reason that we were risking losing him was because he was having a difficulty finding housing that he f appropriate in Arlington. Mm -hmm. And so part of the package to retain him was a housing was housing support. Okay, thanks. Which we very specifically did not set as a standard going forward for future town managers, but just for him. Okay, good to know. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Tosti. Uh, I just wanted to talk about this for a, few, uh, a minute. Um, if you go to a lot of other towns, some of which are even smaller than us, uh, Lexington, Concord. Uh, in other places. Quite often, like Mr. Chapelain said, you have a finance director and you have an assistant town manager. The finance director's overall responsibility in the finance area, sometimes he's called the chief budget officer. I think uh, my uh, title for Mr. Uh, Pooler would be sort of chief budget officer. That's the focus of this. Uh, the assistant town manager is to, is to carry out whatever tasks it could be. So, for example, we have a CPA now. CPA uh, is going to need uh, support. Uh, and the manager's office provided support over the last six months, even though they really didn't have the personnel at the time to do it, but they did it. Uh, but I see the assistant town manager uh, is providing some of that support. If you go back in the town manager's budgets uh, a, a ways back, we always had a deputy town manager and an assistant town manager. Uh, Nancy Gilkowski was the deputy town manager. At one point, and there was Therese de Benedictis was the uh, assistant town manager. They performed different things. If you go to Lexington, you'll have the assistant town manager for finance, and then you'll have the assistant town manager for administration. Uh, you know, same out in Concord and a lot of these other places. Uh, we believe that this administrative uh, expertise and resources is absolutely crucial to running a town in these very complex times when we are uh, hurting for money, you know, virtually all of the time. Uh, let me just give you an example. Um, the, uh, several years ago, uh, town manager Brian Sullivan, at that point deputy town manager Adam Chapelain, uh, jumped on the uh, GIC. Uh, the uh, governor, um, Patrick, signed uh, the uh, bill on like July 1, and uh, they called a selectman's meeting literally about three days later. And they adopted the GIC, they jumped on it, we were the, one of the first ones in. That one change has saved us millions of dollars a year uh, in health insurance costs. If you don't have the capability to do the analysis uh, to see what happens, and health insurance is very complex, 
I mean, most of it is done by the Human Resources Director, but they quite often need help in a lot of these areas. So I, I think uh, adding to the, to the capabilities of our management to do the things that we need to do is, is critical, and we hope you support it. Mr. Schlickman. Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9, motion to terminate debate under Budget 3. Under the town manager budget. Okay. All in favor? Yes. Opposed? Motion is terminated under this budget. It's 11 o'clock. Motion to adjourn. We'll any motions for reconsideration? Any notices of reconsideration on anything we did tonight? Seeing none, we are adjourned till Monday. <laughs>